we were placed here by a loving and a powerful God, but a Absolutely. God that also cares about us. And all these things we typically don't even think of. We just right. take them for granted and we tend to be oblivious to what our Creator has done for us. But when you really start considering how unusual the Earth is, how unusual even the Sun is, yeah. compared to the planets and the stars we see elsewhere, it's a great picture. That's amazing. There are two choices. The so-called Big Bang. Or, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the Earth. Welcome to In Grace's series, our awesome universe, Big Bang or Big God. This series, our awesome universe, Big Bang or Big God, was something that I wanted to do ever since interviewing astronaut Charlie Duke. He had walked on the moon. And since we talked, I dreamed of exploring the universe myself. But since tickets to space are so expensive, we decided to use telescopes and planetariums instead. First, we visited the Answers in Genesis Planetarium in the Cincinnati area with PhD astronomer, Dr. Danny Faulkner. Dr. Faulkner invited us back to look at the night sky in their observatory. After that, we went to Glen Rose, Texas and learned even more from creation researcher, Dr. Carl Baugh. Now, it's on to Washington State where we're planning to meet up with Spike Pissaris. Spike created a fantastic video series about creation astronomy. I've been excited to interview Spike and learn about what led an atheist on a journey to become a creationist. As we drove from the Seattle area toward a historic observatory in the Columbia Plateau, Spike shared how his life took an unexpected turn. I was a total science nerd as a kid. I still have a geology textbook that my mom got me when I was seven. So that's the mm -hmm. kind of kid I was. <laughs> you know, loved geology, paleontology, all that stuff. I was actually planning on being a paleontologist until I was a teenager and then realized that paleontologists tend to starve <laughs> <laughs> while engineers make a lot of money. So that's when I was funny. offered an engineering scholarship, I took it. And while I was in college, my interest shifted from the ground to the sky. For whatever reason, I just became obsessed with cosmology and astronomy and have been that way ever since. Going into the space program work, uh, I believed in the Big Bang cosmology overall. That's where the universe came from. That's where our planet came from. And life started here from non-living chemicals and evolution happened and here we are. But then a coworker who was Christian uh, saw me reading a new agey kind of book over lunch one day. Um, because I'm a hard-headed rationalist engineer who's interested in <laughs> new age stuff, right? Because uh, atheists aren't necessarily consistent. There's a lot of spiritual worldview built into a lot of this. Because we were created spiritual. Right, because we're we spiritual have, beings. So we have right. to have that. Right. So even someone that is atheist, and you said maybe materialist, they're still yearning for that spirit. Absolutely, yeah. That's built into all of us. And even the atheists who are materialists tend to be really adamant that there is no God, and they spend a lot of time being angry at a God that they say doesn't exist. <laughs> so anyway, this coworker saw me reading this book and said, do you believe that stuff? I said, whatever, it's just something I'm reading. And so we started talking, and I find out he's not only a Christian, but also a creationist. And I was kind of surprised because my view of creationists at that point was that which I had absorbed from my heroes, Carl Sagan, Isaac Asimov, Bertrand Russell, you know, all the, the atheists of the 20th century, the big figures. And I thought of creationists as these poor, deluded sort of people uh, who weren't aware of what science actually said on these issues. But I was puzzled because here's this man working with the rest of us, um, presumably an intelligent guy. And I said, well, how do you deny all the obvious evidence for evolution? And he played me straight. He said, well, what obvious evidence is that? <laughs> So I started rolling out all the usual suspects, you know, various fossil sequences and all the rest of it. And he debunked every point that I brought up. <laughs> um, most of it from memory. <laughs> well, um, Sometimes he'd say, I have to look into that, I'll get back to you. And then he did. And then 
but that's he was very gentle about it and very gracious and he was like you know you should look into that because the evolutionists themselves you know threw away that sequence a few years ago wow and so i'd go and look and and sure enough enough, you'd be right that's cool and eventually i ran out of things to ask (laughs) uh, and he noticed and he said well i've answered your questions now you can answer mine Mm. so well that's fair (laughs) he said you believe in the laws of physics don't you i said yeah we use them here every day he said well how do you reconcile them with the big bang model and he didn't even explain what he meant. But as I thought about the question, and I realized, wait a minute, fundamental physics and the Big Bang model don't play well together. In fact, they don't play at all. <laughs> I believe in both, but apparently that's not a consistent position. In addition to not actually being allowed by physics, the Big Bang model goes much farther and also violates some of the most important laws of physics. Probably the most fundamental idea in physics is that energy and matter are conserved. In other words, energy and matter cannot be created nor destroyed. Physicists have known for some time now that energy and matter are interchangeable. For example, you've probably heard of Einstein's famous equation E equals mc squared. The E stands for energy, m stands for mass, which is the amount of matter or physical stuff, and c is the speed of light, which is a very large number. So a lot of energy is contained within a small amount of stuff. And we can convert matter to energy. The most efficient way we know how to do this is in a nuclear explosion. A small amount of stuff releases a tremendous amount of energy. We can also go the other way and convert a lot of energy into a small amount of stuff. We do this in particle accelerators. Tiny particles get accelerated to almost the speed of light and then get smashed together. More material comes out of those collisions than went in. The particle's kinetic energy, the energy contained in their motion, gets converted into matter. So again, we can convert matter to energy and energy to matter, but we can never destroy either one and we can never create either one. This is called the law of conservation of mass energy because the total combined amount of mass and energy in the universe never changes. We can only convert them back and forth. This law is one of the fundamental foundational laws of science. As one of my physics textbooks says, conservation laws are the guiding principles of physics. These are absolute conservation laws. They are always obeyed. But the Big Bang model violates it on the largest possible scale, a universal scale. It says all the energy and matter contained in the entire universe was created from nothing. Therefore, the Big Bang contradicts physics in the most fundamental way possible. Are cosmologists aware of this problem? Yes. Some try to avoid it by claiming that the universe actually consists of balanced amounts of positive and negative energy, which all add up to zero. In other words, even though the universe looks like something, it's actually just nothing. Therefore, they say, on a net basis, the Big Bang didn't really create anything. So there's no problem with physics being violated. This claim is false, though. This idea doesn't work. So the Big Bang continues to violate physics in the most fundamental way and on the largest possible scale. And I didn't necessarily want any of this to be true. I was basically, at this point, going through the sciences systematically, trying to find a way out of this trap that I perceived (laughs) to be closing around me. Uh, But it's like, well, biology doesn't support neo-Darwinism, biochemistry, genetics, not geology, not paleontology, not astronomy. where else am I going to look? Huh. And I finally reached a point where I said, I have one of two choices, and they're both bad. <laughs> I either hold on to my naturalistic worldview, which I now know is not consistent with science. And I can't knowingly adhere to something that I know isn't true. This is the Lord using my pride against me. <laughs> <laughs> But the other option is to say that creation is true. And creation, as I, as I thought of it, was the first in a chain of dominoes. If creation is true, then there's a creator to whom I'm accountable, who is the God of the Bible, who hates sin, in which I've been wallowing my whole life to this point. And at the end of so I'm destined for judgment then. So if the creation domino goes over, then you wind up with me getting judgment, and I didn't want that domino to fall. 
but the only way to stop it is to stop the first one from toppling because <laughs> there's, a, there's a whole sequence. Do you think that's some of the reason that people don't want to... Oh, absolutely. Think even think about this kind of stuff. Uh, yeah, be, yeah. We, we, I mean, we all the ultimate conclusion. Uh, as we said earlier, we're all spiritual beings, and I think that knowledge of the Creator is ingrained in us. Yeah. And finally, I realized. Oh, wait a minute, stupid. Yes, creation is true, and yes, there's a Creator, and yes, you're accountable to Him. But that also means that the gospel is true. Mm. And so that's how. That's I became just, a Christian. That's just a beautiful testimony. It really is. Because you don't have to say there's no evidence, you, you know, just jumping off a cliff, closing your eyes, oh, blind, right, blind right. faith. You literally went through every step you could possibly go through investigating this. Trying to get out of it. And you came <laughs> to the, the conclusion that there is a God. He created this world. He is all powerful, but he's also just. He, he's holy. Right. And he has to deal with our rebellion and our sin. and But he did that by putting it upon his son for cool. us. And, you know, it's the greatest love story in the world that God would love us. In spite of us. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Aren't you amazed when you see the incredible design and beauty of our universe? Let me send you this print, the Eagle Nebula, for free. And this will tell everybody that you believe that God created the heavens and the earth. Let me also encourage you to get our entire four-part series, Our Awesome Universe, Big Bang or Big God. Contact us right now. Request your creation resources today when you give to support in grace. When your gift is $50 or more, you'll receive our exclusive Heavens Declare bundle a $110 value for only $50. Call 800-78-GRACE or visit ingrace.tv to get your resources today. We arrived at the Columbia Basin College's observatory, where Spike and I continued to talk about how perfect all of Earth's parameters are. Let's talk about just how perfect the Earth is in the place in the universe and also its rotation, its tilt, its orbit. All the characteristics yeah. of it as a planet, yeah. sure. Because we tend to take this all this for granted. Right. We, we, I, we don't even think about it. Our day is 24 hours long, and that's just how long it is, right? None of us think about that. You get up in the morning, you do your thing, and that's how. But that period of a day is the result of how long it takes for the Earth to rotate around its axis once. And we all assume that a day is 24 hours. Why wouldn't it be? That's what we've grown up with. But when we look elsewhere in the solar system, we see planets can have a wide variety of length of day. It's not like 24 hours is some preordained or natural number. Uh, on the one extreme, Venus takes 243 days, Earth days, to rotate around its axis once. And it's a similar size. Similar size, similar huh. mass, and all the rest of it. So on the opposite extreme, Jupiter rotates all the way around on its axis once every 10 hours. So if the Earth had a day that was much different than 24 hours, that would have some drastic implications for us here. If we rotated around much more quickly, we'd start to have much higher wind speeds at places, and so storm systems would be a lot more violent. On the other hand, if we rotated more slowly, then any point on the Earth's surface would be exposed to sunlight longer, thus getting hotter, and then on the night side of the Earth for longer, which would make it colder. So we would have much higher temperature swings. But 24 hours is a Goldilocks value, if you will. It's just right as a period for a day. Because of COVID, we weren't able to use the Columbia Basin College's observatory, but fortunately, Spike brought along his personal telescope. We drove out to a dark area and set up. Wow, a telescope out in the middle of nowhere already set up. Imagine that. Pointed at the sky. Pointed specifically at Orion, actually. <laughs> Let me just adjust it a bit, because as the Earth rotates, things move a bit. But we get it back to where it's pointing at. And there we go. Now, you got to get your eye just the right distance from the eyepiece there. So it's a large cloud of greenish gas to wow. the naked eye. 
So that's number 31, this Andromeda Galaxy. Okay. It's actually visible to the naked eye in a really dark night, and if you have good eyes. Yeah. And that's actually the closest large galaxy to us. It's about two and a half million light years away. If you were to travel across the entire Milky Way galaxy, even traveling through space at the speed of light, you would need 100,000 years just to get across. For perspective, if the sun were the size of a period printed on the page of a book, the Milky Way galaxy would be the width of the continental United States. To visit the Andromeda galaxy, the closest large galaxy to us, you would have to travel two and a half million years, and you still wouldn't have left the local group, the small neighborhood of galaxies that we live in. This beautiful galaxy, called M101, or the Pinwheel Galaxy, would take you about 25 million years to reach. And notice that far beyond it, there are many more galaxies. Beyond these, there are countless more. Billions of galaxies, each containing billions of stars. Such a universe is beyond our understanding. We can observe it, but we can't truly comprehend it. As the psalmist said, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high, I cannot attain unto it. Yet for the Lord, creating all this required no effort. The book of Genesis notes that on day four, he made the stars also, as if they were made casually, almost as an afterthought. How could this God, who is so big, care about little, this little earth, let alone little me? Right. It really makes me feel small to stand on. <laughs> I, I feel like I've lost yeah. weight, actually. <laughs> <laughs> is it that easy? Yeah, <laughs> let's, sure. let's do this more often. Let's go stand under the stars. <laughs> yeah, and a lot of atheists reach that conclusion. They say in the vastness of the cosmos, we're nothing. Uh, Lawrence Krauss said we're just a bit of pollution. And other atheists have said similar things. You know, how can you believe in a God when we're so insignificant in this cosmos? But the cosmos tells us that the opposite is true. Because the Bible says this is the creator who did all this. And Jesus specifically is mentioned as the creator. And Yet the God who made all of this, apparently with not much effort, it's only mentioned in two words in Genesis, uh, and stars, that's it. That's almost as an afterthought. The one who made all this nevertheless cares for us enough to have taken on human form and come here. So the atheist draws the wrong conclusion. He says this proves we're insignificant. I argue it proves we're significant. Very much so. That the one who created all this nevertheless cares for us enough to have done this for us, to have gone through this process that we can't even understand to take our sin upon himself and redeem us. I like when someone's under a large sky like we are, I can show you a few galaxies in the sky with a telescope and some of them will look nice and some of them not so much, um, but we're not even getting a, a real picture of how many there are. And we didn't even get this fully until recently with Hubble, where a few years back, the head of the Hubble program, as one of the perks of his job, gets to assign to whatever he wants. Mm -hmm. When one thing he chose to do was point it to a spot in the sky that appeared to be dark, that uh -huh. appeared to have nothing in it. Uh -huh. And they did the Hubble equivalent of a long exposure photograph. Uh -huh. And they found out that in this little spot of sky that otherwise doesn't seem to have anything in it, when you look at it long enough and gather more light, there's a lot of galaxies back there. Wow. And since then they've uh, done the Hubble deep field and ultra deep field and done longer and longer exposures with this. and in a tiny spot in the sky, there are thousands of galaxies. And you can look at a photograph and say, well, yeah, that's a lot of galaxies, but what does that mean? The latest version of, of this photograph has some, somewhere in the order of 10,000 galaxies in this amount of sky that would be hidden from your view if you held up a grain of sand up at arm's length. Behind the grain of sand is 10,000 galaxies. And multiply that across the whole sky. And this is beyond our comprehension, yeah. the vastness of all this. What's our foundation here? And the, the second major revolution was the, the shift of particle physics from being the idea of something you can determine strictly from equations versus quantum mechanics, which expresses things as probabilities, but that's probably too much detail. <laughs> hey, you but, lost me, but you know what? Yeah, it's sorry. okay. <laughs> we're, we're under a beautiful sky and a really nice warm night in Washington state. Right. But you can't control the weather or the wind. Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> <laughs> but we do know a God that can. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you very much, yeah. Spike. Appreciate it. Thanks for coming out. I hope you've enjoyed today's In Grace series. And I'm so excited about the universe that God has made and, and how it's all 
so perfectly designed and planned and, and has order. The Bible says that God created the world and it was good, it was right, and then we sinned and we messed it up. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And that's a big problem. If God is righteous and he's holy, then if we're sinners, what are we gonna do? Well, a lot of people say, I can save myself. I can do good works, I can be religious, I can go to church. But the Bible actually says you cannot be good enough to go to heaven. So what are we gonna do? Well, fortunately, God is not only just and righteous, but he's also full of mercy and he is love. He has loved us so much that he sent his son Jesus to die for our sins on a cross and he rose again the third day. Can you imagine the creator coming into the creation to save the creature? That is incredible love. That's the story of the Bible. And if you've never by faith accepted the truth that Jesus is the son of God who died for your sins on a cross and rose again, and not a religion, not a church, but in Jesus Christ, then I encourage you to do that right now. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Aren't you amazed when you see the incredible design and beauty of our universe? Let me send you this print, the Eagle Nebula, for free. And this will tell everybody that you believe that God created the heavens and the earth. Let me also encourage you to get our entire four-part series, Our Awesome Universe, Big Bang or Big God. Contact us right now. Request your creation resources today when you give to support in grace. When your gift is $50 or more, you'll receive our exclusive Heavens Declare bundle, a $110 value for only $50. Call 800-78-GRACE or visit ingrace.tv to get your resources today. Join us next week for part four of our awesome universe, Big Bang or Big God. You look at the textbooks, the science programs, whatever, you'll be told that the giant impact model explains where the moon came from. But the research I'm talking about was published in 2008. Wow. So the giant impact model has been discredited for 13 years now, but it's still being taught as if it's true. I don't think that's a good way to, for education to work. No. Uh, if you don't have an explanation, you should say so. Exactly. Record every single In Grace episode. You will be so blessed as we learn all about God's world and God's Word. In Grace is a viewer-supported ministry. Thank you for your prayers and gifts.